I think like policies anywhere, what is the purpose of policies is to make sure that ideas are built, uh, or principles really, are built into institutional practice. Uh, you and I, for example, are passionate about gender in the media, and there are people in newsrooms and media houses who are passionate about it, but they come and go. And we need to make sure that those principles are embedded in the way that we do things. So at Journalinks, um, we've been through many phases in our work with gender in the media research. Obviously, evidence was the starting point. But we realized that if we were to bring about change, uh, we need to go from that evidence to, to changing uh, the way things are done in newsrooms. And the only way we could figure out to do that um, is through getting media houses to work through uh, what policy changes they need to make, both <clears throat> in the institutional culture of the organization, but also in editorial policies and practice. Simple things like if a journalist goes out to do a story, they must get more than one source, you know, that's obvious. But of the sources they get, they must ensure that at least half of those are women. I mean, imagine if we had that simple principle in every newsroom and it were observed, we wouldn't be having the same old story we get in the Global Media Monitoring Project every five years. When you look at the aggregate figures, it's obviously quite depressing because you aggregate all the numbers, some move forward, some move backwards. So I take inspiration from individual media houses that I've worked with that I can, uh, as a researcher, track longitudinally from where we began to where they are now. So I look, for example, at the Mauritius Broadcasting Corporation that we've worked with over many years. They started with an average of 14% women sources, and now they're up to 28%, which is not where they need to be yet, but it's double where it was. And what is significant is what they tell us about how that has changed them as a public broadcaster, not just around gender, but around being responsive to the public whom they serve, because after all, half of the public are women. So it is when you look uh, media house by media house <clears throat> that you see the change that that brings uh, to media content, to media programming, new kinds of programs. Uh, take the example again of the Mauritius Broadcasting Corporation where uh, one of the programs they introduced was uh, uh, portraits of ordinary people is what they called it, but many portraits of women. So they would go out and look for women divers, for example. Uh, you know, that's a story about Mauritius you don't hear. You hear of the tourism, the sun, the sunshine. But what about the women who are guarding the coast? It, it gives the media a whole new way of seeing things. And when they begin, begin to articulate themselves that it has made them um, improve the quality of their journalism, in, in, improve their audiences or their readership, then you know that that's going to be a lasting change. Leadership, number one. <laughs> leadership, um, inspired leadership. Everywhere where there has been any kind of change, lasting change, it has start, started with um, a leader who has vision. And, and, and when I say this, it's not only women, there have been a lot of men as well who've seen the value of it. Of course, uh, particularly when we're talking about the private, but any media, if they can see that what is good politics is also good for business, uh, that's great because, uh, you know, media is always looking at its bottom line. But media has to be reminded that 52% of consumers are women. And very often, patriarchal assumptions have been made about the news uh, and the, the content that, that, that women uh, consume. Uh, you know, one of the things we found in our media work is quite frightening, actually, is that many media houses have no clue at all who their audiences are. They don't do uh, regular uh, audience surveys, not very scientific surveys anyway, uh, that would inform them. So we found that um, one of the, the good outcomes of this is media houses really beginning to think much more about their audiences. The constraints, of course, uh, the one we always hear is around financial constraints. 
Uh, the media is going through quite a difficult period everywhere because of technology and convergence and the citizen journalist and what is the media and the print media as we know is reeling at the moment. So we've seen in many of our uh, in media houses, especially the print media, juniorization uh, of newsrooms. So you have a few people, you know, the editors and so on at the top. Uh, and then that, that sort of middle of um, you know, the reporter is kind of disappearing. You have these young journalists who spend most of their time doing social media, it seems. Um, so one of my fears, obviously, as a, as a journalist of many years, uh, is, is, is the analytical and the in-depth and the feature quality of journalism um, is really threatened. And that has big implications for gender because gender issues are never simple. And they require us to go out and do in-depth reporting. Child marriages, for example, how are you going to write, report about that? Mm -hmm. Uh, sitting in capital cities, you have to go out to the rural areas. Uh, so the financial constraint is a real one, and you know a big part of what we're trying to do is improve the quality of journalism. And you cannot improve the quality of journalism when you're sitting in your armchair and when you don't have uh, resources to go out and do good quality journalism. So. We hear this over and over again, but uh, at the same time, we try to go back and challenge the media about what is uh, the purpose of the media, especially the public media. Uh, if it is to give voice to the voiceless, then you have to find the voiceless.